<clears throat> Greetings and welcome. This happens to be the 21st in a series that began almost two years ago under the aegis of the International Chamber of Commerce, Sri Lanka. So the 21st webinar. And this is in association with the Daily FT here in Sri Lanka. We also have partners in Women in Management, the ACCA, then DP Education, also the MBA Alumni Association of the University of Colombo, and Salon Innovents. We just like to inform everyone that the platform that this webinar will be accessed by viewers all over the globe will be via FB or Facebook, as well as YouTube. Namely, the Salon Innovent YouTube link is now up and running, and you can be following us on that, as well as, as I said, on Facebook. And uh, that will be the ICC Sri Lanka Facebook page, ACCA, then the Daily FT, as well as LNW, that's Lanka News Network. So um, we would like to invite all of you to uh, view on any of those that you might select. We have sponsors in Ceylon, oh, I beg your pardon, Capital Alliance Limited, as well as ACCA. So thank you very much to our sponsors for making this 21st webinar possible. The topic has everything to do with this country of Sri Lanka, strategies for a Lankan economic recovery post pandemic. That's quite a mouthful. And the moment I look at that, I'm reminded of a 1940 musical composition, which was by Rogers and Hart and included in a musical. Oh yeah, musical. It was a romantic song and nothing to do with the realities that we face today, but the title, Bewitched, Bothered and Bewildered was the title of the song. It looks very much like that applies to the current uh, imbroglio. <laughs> the current scenario that is facing the people of this country. And they are eagerly watching to see what next. And so strategies come in. And we're very happy to have several speakers who will be addressing this topic. Subsequent to that, we will have eminent panelists from different parts of the globe who have been brought in with their own specialties, touching on technology, agriculture, uh, and uh, the profession of accountancy, business, tax, and so on and so forth, all of which uh, have a role to play in what we might refer to as the economic recovery post-pandemic for Sri Lanka. So that's setting the stage. Now let's get to a slightly more detailed uh, perspective on this country, Sri Lanka. Notably, this particular audiovisual material was created in this same year of 2021, but much earlier than October. This was about six to seven months ago. And how was it that Sri Lanka was perceived to be at that time? We'd like to think of that even as we deal with post pandemic. Okay, here's the clip. Watch it, please and make your own observations on what you see and hear. On the occasion of the launch of the Sri Lanka development update, I wanted to share with you a snapshot of our analysis. The Sri Lankan economy is on the road to recovery. The country's economy is expected to grow by 3.4% in 2021, mainly due to foreign investments, as well as normalizing tourism and other economic activities. This positive outlook follows a 3.6% contraction in 2020, the worst economic downturn on record, as is the case with many countries fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. Moving forward, we face challenges. 
challenges. The slow global recovery, coupled with continued trade restrictions, economic scarring from the slowdown, and the high debt burden may continue to affect growth in Sri Lanka as with other countries. As Sri Lanka advances its efforts at pursuing an export-oriented growth model, it will be important to tap the full potential of private investments. This could help the country increase its competitiveness and raise growth in a sustainable way. As we move forward, it is also important to strengthen social protection systems and invest in digital technologies. This is now more critical than ever. The $3.20 uh, poverty line rate is projected to have increased from 9.2% in 2019 to 11.7% in 2020. Job and earning losses due to the pandemic were more pronounced in urban areas and among private sector employees and informal workers. The government has acted decisively with steps such as cash transfers key elements for economic recovery in Sri Lanka, especially from an angle of uh, digitalization as a critical strategy based on research I've led at the Asian Development Bank until August. So some, some of the uh, macroeconomic indicators I'd like to recap um, uh, from the World Bank uh, figure. Uh, um, first, uh, Delta coronavirus uh, variant outbreak led the nationwide lockdown. So as a result, uh, ADB uh, downward uh, uh, revised uh, GDP growth, as you can see, from 4.1% to 3.4% this year. And then next year, 3.4%, 4, 3 uh, the same uh, growth rate. And um, uh, central government that GDP growing uh, to more than slightly more than 100% uh, last year. Moreover, because of the lockdown, a budget deficit is likely to be higher than expected. Um, and also uh, from different angle, softening in remittances, low cluster recovery in tourism, uh, large debt repayment will uh, constrain growth. So that's why IDB downward graded uh, 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 GDP growth. As for the inflation, uh, volatile food prices, rising global oil prices and commodity prices, and also exchange, exchange rate the depreciation, um, uh, inflation forecasts uh, uh, increased to 5.1% this year and 5.3% next year. And the third uh, macroeconomic figure I listed here, current account balance to GDP ratio. Uh, during the first half of 2021, merchant trade deficit increased by 32% to 
uh, year on year as import outpace export amid uh, higher commodity prices and relaxation of uh, some import restrictions. So current account deficit is um, expected to widen to 2.8% uh, of GDP this year, 2.3% uh, next year. Uh, in terms of uh, critical vaccination rollout, as of uh, October 16, 67% uh, at least one dose and 58% uh, fully vaccinated. So rapid vaccination is a key to economic recovery and uh, risks to the outlook uh, from a fresh uh, pandemic outbreak um, and low foreign reserves and currency-related uh, currency uh, stress. So these are a quick um, uh, recap of economic outlook. So according to ADB research on COVID recovery, um, uh, including this book um, published by ADB Institute uh, last week, we can set key strategies, uh, three uh, here. Uh, number one is a revival of uh, economic fundamentals, uh, especially by revigorating tourism sector, micro, small, medium enterprises, employment, migration remittances, social protection, achieving better fiscal sustainability. So second um, important strategy is to make economy and society resilient by strengthening health sector as well as other social sectors by investing physical and human infrastructure. And the third um, important strategy is to address long-term challenges such as con continuing growth and uh, reducing poverty and inequality, addressing climate change and environmental uh, issues, and, and then um, uh, building disaster resilience. All of uh, these three key strategies, I would say, or many would agree, digitalization of economy by adopting new technologies is a cross-cutting critical element to pursue these three key strategies. So indeed, uh, digitalization has a uh, great potential. So here, uh, this chart shows the um, in internet penetration rate on uh, horizontal access and uh, vertical access is per capita spending. Internet penetration rate in Sri Lanka just before COVID-19, year 2019, was uh, 34%. But the latest figure, uh, actually January 2021 figure, said that more than 50% of internet uh, uh, penetration rate. Revenue in e-commerce, um, e revenue in e-commerce markets um, uh, is uh, projected to reach um, uh, uh, um, uh, 12, uh, uh, more than 1 uh, billion in year 2021. But the per capita market uh, size is still uh, rather low. Only, according to my uh, calculation, only 56 US dollars in year 2021. So in this chart, uh, Sri Lanka is located in the uh, uh, middle uh, 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 down. And um, actually, this means um, Sri Lanka has a large and growing number of users continuously, market size expanding rapidly, according to um, before and after COVID-19 uh, figure. And also most importantly, uh, we can envision um, uh, immense growth opportunities for Sri Lanka by tapping uh, this uh, digitalization opportunities. Indeed, um, one of the, our recent ADB uh, reports estimates, uh, if digitalization is successful in overall South Asia, Digitalization can generate annual gains of GDP by more than 7%, close to 8%. Trade increase almost 9% annually, and employment generation by 4% uh, annually. So uh, digitalization will play a key role in economic recovery in Sri Lanka. Having this set, challenges uh, remain um, uh, for uh, Sri Lanka, binding for Sri Lanka. Uh, so this is um, uh, also from our uh, ADB's uh, Asian Economic Integration Report uh, released earlier this year. Um, um, actually, uh, digital platform penetration index and network readiness index. So this uh, cross-country comparable index shows uh, uh, Sri Lanka among the developing uh, Asian economies ranked rather lower, as you can see. And um, uh, there are four uh, sub-indexes. Uh, um, uh, number one is a technology sub-index, uh, which measure access content and the future uh, possibility of innovations. Second column shows the people's uh, sub-index, meaning that the people's readiness and aptitude, not only individuals, but also businesses and also government. And third uh, column shows the sub-index. Um, uh, government, uh, towards the government, uh, how uh, trust level people, 
and also government regulation and uh, inclusion. So these are captured by gov governance or government uh, sub-index. And then finally, but not least, impact uh, uh, sub-measure uh, 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 sub captured the um, uh, impact of uh, digitalization on economic value, quality of life, and uh, overall contribution to SDGs. So unfortunately, um, um, uh, latest figure, year 2020 figure, uh, shows that Sri Lanka uh, still um, have um, um, uh, uh, room for improvement. But this means that uh, Sri Lanka, again, has um, uh, immense um, uh, uh, pot potential and unleashing uh, potential will make Sri Lanka's recovery um, uh, resilient and uh, uh, sustainable. So this is my final chart. In order to unlock this uh, immense uh, digital potential, uh, three policy priorities are listed here. Number one, uh, affordability and accessibility uh, to uh, ICT infrastructure is critical to unleash uh, uh, this potential. But at the same time, um, uh, top right, uh, people's uh, digital skills and literacy and training, uh, these are also indispensable. So people well-educated get the right skills to use uh, ICT technology and internet. Uh, affordable uh, access can uh, enable uh, uh, for people to uh, get on board. Of course, uh, for transactions, uh, e-commerce and other type of transaction, uh, financial uh, settlement is uh, critical. So a second one from the um, uh, uh, second one in uh, left uh, part showing uh, e-payment availability and options. That's uh, really uh, one of the necessary uh, conditions. And also, um, once people get connected and they can use internet, uh, place the uh, order and make a payment. But if logistics and delivery infrastructure binding, um, uh, the overall gain will not materialize. So uh, we shouldn't forget uh, uh, logistics and delivery infrastructure, basic physical infrastructure will be in also this indispensable component. And um, also right uh, middle, um, in order to make a whole ecosystem, laws and rules and regulations for data uh, protection, uh, cyber security, and also um, uh, competition environment would be uh, very, very critical. Um, and this environment should be set uh, properly by the government. And um, uh, finally, uh, but not least, uh, down right, uh, showing that um, uh, government can also tap uh, enormous gain out of a digital economy through uh, international tax cooperation and also um, um, uh, uh, reallocating domestic uh, resource uh, uh, mobilization. So indeed, ADB ha has set up uh, international tax cooperation and domestic re resource mobilization, the RM half um, uh, earlier this year, May uh, 2021, to make uh, you know this uh, digitalization um, uh, support the government operation. Uh, admittedly, right now, uh, government is still operating, um, uh, you know, fiscal expansion to support the economy and also poverty reduction and uh, building up resilience. So it's not the uh, necessary right timing to switch a gear for the government from uh, fiscal expansion to fiscal con consolidation. But uh, in the medium term, I think uh, digital potential should be unleashed and uh, part of the benefit should be um, uh, captured by the government. Thank you, thank you very much. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you too, Professor Sawada. And we were able to recognize that you have placed much emphasis on the possibilities with digitalization as part of the strategy uh, for recovery, as part of the strategy for recovery. So much there to think about. And the idea of digitalization and technology that goes with it also is something that has been of much interest to the next of our speakers. And that is Mr. Dhammika Pereira, who is certainly not a stranger to many in the corporate sector in Sri Lanka. He's a very well-known figure in corporate circles of this country, a founder, chairman, and managing director of the Valuable One Group. And he has invested in a wide range of businesses, both in this country as well as overseas. And he's been very interested in management techniques 
a practical application of skills and knowledge with regard to management of businesses. And that has been uh, much that he has done uh, research on. Much research has been done by him on that subject. Now, his range of interests are very wide, but for today, his presentation, his keynote will be with regard to the topic of agriculture. I just like to mention that what Mr. Dhammika Pereira has been doing quite a while now is planning and making arrangements for things to work out, not with wishful thinking or mumbo jumbo, but rather with an analysis of data and also focusing on education, which has been of grave concern to him, preparing Sri Lanka to meet the realities of the future. In fact, he has published a document known as the Vision 2030. So all of uh, such ideas are incorporated in that document. So Vision 2030 has data, has information, has analysis, and also how technology can be brought to bear in bringing all of these things together. Well, he has the possibility to explain things much better, and he will. But as I said, his focus in this presentation will be agriculture. Mr. Dhammika Pared. Thank you for inviting me for today's program. Firstly, I will explain how my journey has taken place in creating strategies to develop Sri Lanka. In 2005, I was part of the Strategic Enterprise Management Agency, SEMA, for 10 years. And I was able to get an understanding how various ministries function. Alone with the experience gained at SEMA and the time I have invested since February 2005 in studying more than 70 countries and their strategies in increasing GDP per capita, uh, published my policy book in 2019 on economic growth strategy, Sri Lanka 2030, a developed nation. Let's listen to the audio book for the recommended action. I Chapter 9, Ministry of Agriculture and Agro-Based Industry. Nation rich in prosperity. Through the optimal utilization of natural resources in a sustainable manner and the promotion of good agricultural practices, the agricultural productivity in the economy can be increased. Dhammika Pereira Goals Drive inclusive agricultural transformation Increase agricultural productivity for farmers. Increase farmers' household income. Increase equitable consumption of a safe, affordable and nutritious diet year-round. Increase women's empowerment in agriculture. Action Plan 1. Distribute soil health cards and soil test-based fertilizer recommendations. Currently, 35,000 containers of fertilizer are imported. With the introduction of soil health cards and fertilizer recommendations, 20%, 7,000 containers of imports can be reduced. Two. Carry out preliminary agricultural land preparation for farmers by local authorities using required machinery. 3. Improve irrigation infrastructure to support cultivation. A. Rehabilitation and capacity improvement of 2,400 tanks. B. Identify and develop the tank cascade system. C. Develop and rehabilitate irrigation wells. 4. Ensure timely availability 
of quality seeds at affordable rates. 5. Provide a subsidy for liquid fertilizer and organic farming. 6. Pay the current fertilizer subsidy in cash during the drought season to cover farmers' living expenses. 7. Develop a dedicated e commerce portal to promote and increase profitability of organic farming, thereby increasing the availability of organic produce for consumers. 8. Implement smart farming. A. Farmer crop profiling and monitoring. B. Seven day weather forecast. C. Climate based advisory and climate smart irrigated agriculture program. D. Fertilizer application recommendation. E. Crop stage monitoring. F. Geotagging and mapping of plots. G. Area surveys to guarantee minimum price of crops for farmers. H. Harvest predictions. I. Pest disease and advisory. Timely crop advisory. J. End to end traceability from nursery to trade. K. Mobile crop advisory app for farmers. L. Complete mapping of crops in Sri Lanka through satellite imagery to understand the extent of cultivation and estimate production. M. Algorithm based matchmaking between suppliers and buyers. N. Reduce agriculture wastage by predicting crop yields across the country and providing optimal storage solutions. 9. Impose 50% of the current import duty at the beginning of the planting season and the remainder at a later stage for all imported fresh produce that is locally grown. 10. Build an economic centre in every district. 11. Share technical videos on crop cultivation methods on YouTube in Sinhalese and Tamil. 12. Provide daily information on crop production, input supply and marketing to farmers via the internet. 13. Utilize domestic marketing channels and carry out advertising campaigns to promote the consumption of agricultural produce strengthen wholesale markets, develop farmers and agricultural cooperative markets and promote contract farming. 14. Establish a national warehousing grid to ensure necessary logistical linkages for warehousing of agricultural produce to match district-wise requirements. 15. Launch a mobile app-based system to promote the availability and rental of agro-implements. 16. Assist the private sector to open 10 large-scale hybrid isolated seed gardens by providing a hybrid DXT coconut seeds with a yield of 120 coconuts per tree owned by government farms. B. Provide training for artificial pollination. Agriculture exports. 17. 
provide free landing and parking facilities for all cargo airlines at BIA Katunayaka, Palali, Trincomalee, Batikalo, Koggala, Mattala, and Digana in Kandy in order to encourage agricultural exports. 18. Facilitate cargo airlines to fly internationally from Trincomalee, Batikalo, Koggala, and Digana Kandy. 19. Reduce all agricultural imports and implement a predictable export and import policy. 20. Encourage public private partnerships to reach a 300 million US dollar target for durian and mango exports, providing plants and technology to the private sector. Allow import of durian plants from Thailand to open nurseries and sell plants. 21. Provide the private sector with young, sweet coconut seeds imported from Thailand, enabling them to open isolated seed gardens and sell plants. 22. Encourage the processing of value-added agro-products for the local and export market by the provision of tax breaks. Thank you for listening. If you want to access the fully audio book on action item listed for various sectors such as education, agriculture, tourism, finance and planning, please visit www.audio.dhammikaperera.lk or the website dhammikaperera.lk. Thank you. Thank you for And thank you too, Mr. Tamika Pereira. Very detailed and specific, and it can't be any more strategic than that. Thank you very much. It was so lucidly presented, and we really appreciate those several points uh, that you were able to bring forth uh, to this audience. Which brings us now to our third speaker, and uh, because of the inconvenience of the time factor and our speaker being located in a different time zone, it was thought prudent that the conversation will be pre recorded. And it has been pre recorded. The conversation is conducted with Mr. Dinesh Virakuri, who is the chairman of the ICC Sri Lanka. And our conversation is with Peter Capelli, the George. W. Taylor Professor of Management at Wharton School and Director of the Wharton Center for Human Resources. And he served as a senior advisor to the Kingdom of Bahrain for employment policy in that country. And interestingly, he co-authored India Way, a book that has sold over 50 million copies at this time. So are there lessons to be learned by Sri Lanka from the experience of India? Well, that's a good question and we might find the answer. And did corporate India have to respond all on its own and rally round and rally forth while the government was asleep? Well. Listen up very, very carefully to this conversation with uh, Dinesh Virakuri and Mr. Capelli. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor Peter. We are very fortunate to have you joining on this program. I'm going to keep it brief up front to get the best out of these 12 minutes. Uh, so my first question to you, to you is, you co-authored one of the world's best sellers, the India Way. What are the key takeaways for an emerging country like Sri Lanka? Well, I think 
uh, what was impressive about the Indian companies that we looked at, so we interviewed the CEOs of the 120 biggest companies in India. What was impressive is that, as you all know from India, they were able to do a lot without much of any help, right? The, we all know the joke that business prospers while the government sleeps, you know, that uh, government was not a big help. They didn't have a lot of infrastructure around. They didn't get a lot of support from the, uh, from the broader infrastructure and things. They had to do a lot of things on their own. So I think what was impressive about the way they operated was to recognize that the employees really matter. They had a social purpose, it wasn't just about making money. They took that very seriously, the idea that there was a reason we were doing what we're doing that mattered to the country, mattered to the people around us. Now uh, that was, I think, quite important. They were willing to do things that were countercultural. You know, India, of course, is a society with great hierarchy, and they were willing to cut against that, to empower workers and teams to make decisions and do things when that was the smart way to operate. Right? They persevered, and maybe this was a cultural thing about the ability to just find a way to get things done, even if it wasn't maybe the most logical way, you know, just bang on problems until uh, you found a way to get through them, rather than planning in a really complicated way. So we've kind of embraced this with a different label now in the US. This is the agile idea in software, right? You just get a smart team, you put them together, you get out of the way, you support them, you don't try to plan it all out. And the Indian companies were kind of doing this, I think, intuitively. And maybe this came out of a tradition of having to survive uh, with less. You know, I think something else, particularly for uh, maybe particularly now for Western countries, because we're waking up to this, is to be able to take the challenges of diversity quite seriously. Your country, India, countries around you have great diversity uh, attributes and, and needs. People who come from very different religions, different ethnic groups, where those things all matter a lot, and trying to find ways to get people to work together and get along, you know, was really quite important. So I'd say overall, the big thing about Indian companies uh, that made them really successful, and that I think we could all learn something from, is to take management quite seriously, right? It's not just about finance. None of these companies were talking about fancy deals that they cut. It wasn't really about marketing, you know, just trying to get good at things internally, how to manage our people, especially, to try them to get them to do great things. And that's something maybe especially important to countries that don't have a lot of infrastructure around them, that don't have you know, lots of talented people already skilled and educated, you can just throw at problems, and that don't have a government that's very supportive of business, you know. So those, I think, were the key things. Thank you. Uh, based on your years of research, do national cultures and institutions influence a nation's success? What are some, what are some, some examples? Yeah, so one of the things that my colleagues who study international business have been quick to point out is the notion that we are all becoming one great big homogeneous world, at least in the developed countries, is simply not true. I mean, it is true that international brands are bigger than ever and communication with the internet is easier. That's certainly true, but it's still the case that trade across countries is not nearly as big as we think, particularly in the developed countries. People don't move quite as much as we think. We forget that around World War II and before then, there were no passports. People used to come and, and that countries really matter. And because countries matter for business success, for, that people in the country have matters. And the obvious reason for this is, if you think the culture of your bidder, which is incompatible with the people in it, you know, if you were all raised in a country with a particular set of values, and you want to have a culture in your business that is different from that, you're just fighting it the whole time. It's going to be quite 
difficult to do. So, you know, you can see around the world, different parts of the world have different cultures, national cultures. You know, Israel has been very individualistic country and even more so than the US on most of these measures. And, you know, it's, you know, the, the big Asian economic powers like Japan and Korea have been particularly good at organizational uh, performance, you know, companies where everyone is aligned and, and work hard. Uh, and if you look at, uh, you know, the different European countries, they have traditions and cultures that make them good at particular industries. You know, the food industry is becoming, it has been in France, you know, design issues are very important in countries like Denmark, you know, so the reason they have these competencies at least stems from their history and the culture and what your workforce was brought up with because they bring that into uh, the companies where they work. Uh, uh, for example, India has that uh, in building that. Yeah, so I think we would say that uh, India has a kind of mixed talent pool. If you compare the two great powers in your region, China and India, right? We saw that China, uh, of course, where the government is so important to business, made a huge push toward what we might call mid-level skills. You know, it wasn't higher education, but it was getting everybody, everybody sort of, you know, reasonably well and better at getting a few people really highly educated. You know, the best universities in India are terrific and the graduates, you know, compete everywhere. So India was really good at having lots of engineering talent, at least initially. The problem that India ran into at the high end now is those institutions that are great in India for education are quite small. Uh, you know, compared to a university engineering school, take the US, for example, the University of Illinois has 40,000 students, right? Which is bigger than all the Indian Institutes of Technology put together. So the problem that Indian companies had to deal with was how to get a group of people who were pretty well educated, but not in the fields where they needed them, how to get those people up to speed in fields like IT, very quickly, and they have been very good at that, taking biology students and English students and history majors and turning them into IT people in the space of a few months, right? And they've done that with systematic training that is kind of mimicked a little bit on campuses, what goes on in universities. So they've been really good at that, and they've spent a lot of time and money trying to do it. Uh, I know Wharton does a lot of research. What are some of the key lessons for pandemic for HR? Well, uh, you know, the issue about the pandemic, of course, is it's still going on. You know, we're beginning to, to change a little bit. I'd say the big lesson that we should take away from this is in the office context seem to survive and do okay when people were working remotely. That's the big punchline. The reason for that seems to be because employers trusted their workers and gave them control over when they could work and how they could get things done. Recording in progress. And this is a kind of counter to a persistent and kind of res resistant trend in much of management that believes Recording that you can't stopped. trust your workers. You have to watch them all the time. Um, unless you stand over them and try to make them do things, they won't get them done. And we see, even though this succeeded for most companies, we see still this lack of trust. And uh, we see it in the form of what we call now tattleware. Tattleware is the software to try to monitor your remote workers and make sure they're always at their desk and they're always working which defeats the purpose for being home for most people, right? Which is the ability to go talk to your kids, start them on their homework, let the dog in, get back to your office or your desk, work later if you need to in order to get things done, right? Uh, it just doesn't work, this micromanaging. I mean, we've known it for decades, it doesn't work. And yet 
many people in business just believe it. It is an ideology. It's not evidence-based for them. So I'd say the biggest lesson is just to remind people that you really can empower people and you really can trust them. You have to create a context where they care about what they're doing and they know there are consequences if they don't do a good job. Uh, but if you do that, they can get the work done. You don't have to micromanage them. They'll be happier. The productivity will probably be better. The quality will be better for sure. I'd say that's the biggest lesson from this. Okay. Uh, uh, Professor, what are the skills, industries, and services that will drive the next wave of growth uh, post-pandemic? Uh, you know, I, I think we have struggled with that question forever. Right? To, to the U.S. government, uh, in particular, had been placing bets for generations. You know that says we will need these skills in a few years. We will need, and, and it's always it's always proved wrong. Uh, so it it is very difficult, you know, to say what those skills will be. Even if you say something like, you know, IT skills are are important. You know, the problem there is even though IT becomes more important, it also gets can do things with IT and computer systems that it would have taken sophisticated programmers. So, you know, using IT doesn't, isn't necessarily the same thing as needing IT skills. So I think that one's kind of a myth. I think if you, you know, my best guess as to what the future looks like is that it will look like the past only more so. And that is trends that have been underway for a while are the big ones. And they're the ones that are likely to matter. Occasionally, there are things that really shake us out of our direction, like the pandemic, like the global recession, uh, the Great Recession in 2009, completely unpredictable. Uh, it's difficult to imagine how you would prepare or try to anticipate those things. So the things that have been underway for a while in the workforce are, you know, uh, the ability to manage people becomes more important, I think. Uh, we understand that interpersonal skills really matter. We've always known that, but this, a lot of this is just working its way down to the average employer, let's say. We've always known those things matter a lot. Uh, being able to solve problems on your own seems to be working better. The move away from bureaucracy toward teams, those things are probably going to continue. So if you wanted to bet on something, I would bet on those changes which are already underway, they're likely to continue for a while. So, so thank you uh, very much for taking time out to talk to us. It's a pleasure talking to you. And I look forward to rereading your book, The India Way. Good, good. Like I was you. looking for it in my library. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. Good. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, too. We are grateful for those insights that were delivered to this audience by Mr. Capelli, which brings us now to the panel discussion. Now, we have nine panelists who have been invited to be part of these proceedings, and uh, I am happy to introduce them by name. And uh, thereafter, I will also introduce the first of our uh, moderators who will conduct the first portion of this question and answer session. And then thereafter, there will be a change and uh, we will have the chairman of ICC Sri Lanka, Mr. Dinesh Virakori, taking over uh, a little later. So we have different areas that come in uh, as the range of interest uh, with regard to the panelists. From uh, Taxation or the subject of taxation comes into play here with uh, Mr. Duminda Pulangamo, who is a partner with Ernst & Young. Then we have Mr. Rajendra Thiagaraja, who is a former chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce and CEO of the Hat National Bank, as well as NDB. Then we have uh, Honorable Member of Parliament, as, uh, as well as being a former senior professor at the University of Colombo, his subject being economics, Professor Ranjit Bandara, MP. 
Mr. Jeevan Nyanam is the group CEO and founder of Veracity AI, as well as Digital Reality. And obviously, IT comes into play uh, with his range of interest and expertise. Economics again with Professor Senepal Abe Ratna, who is a senior professor in economics at the Department of Economics with the University of Colombo. Then joining us from Washington, D.C. in the United States, we have the senior economist, the World Bank Group, South Asia region. Uh, it's uh, Sibel Kolaxis. And then we have Mr. Talal Rafi, who is the global consultant on entrepreneurship and is a member of the World Economic Forum Expert Network. Then we have Mr. Sanjay Jaratna, who is the president of the Sri Lanka Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. Obviously, pharmaceuticals also come into play with regard to the recovery strategies for Sri Lanka. And last and certainly not least, we have Dr. Shekha Shah, who is the former Director General of NCAER in New Delhi and the Regional Economic Advisor for South Asia with the World Bank and uh, also located in Washington, D.C. So without further ado, we'll invite Mr. Nista Kasim, who is the um, founder, yes. editor and CEO of the Daily FT to take over at this point. And he will continue until roughly six o'clock and thereafter hand over proceedings to Mr. Dinesh Virakoti, who will be taking up uh, more questions that would have been uh, forthcoming from those who are viewing this on Facebook and other social media, as well as YouTube and so on. Okay, so Nista, over to you now. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Arun. Um, excellent introductions we had. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll start uh, straight uh, with the questions. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, Sibel uh, from the World Bank. Uh, recently, the World Bank uh, published a poverty assessment for Sri Lanka. And can we know what were the key findings and what were the recommendations in addressing some of the challenges listed in the report? Thank you, Mr. Kasim, and thank you for inviting me to this great, important event. Yes, the World Bank on October 7th published a recent uh, poverty assessment. And uh, the main finding is that as a result of the COVID crisis, Sri Lanka's poverty rate increased from 9.2% in 2019 to 11.7% in 2020. So po poverty is projected to remain above pre-pandemic levels uh, in, in uh, 2021 this year. Similar to the rest of the world, food insecurity could worsen and poverty reduction may slow down if food prices remain high and shortages continue. But the good news is that Sri Lanka's economy is estimated to grow to uh, more than 3.3% in 2021, as the World Bank country director, Faris Haddad Zar was mentioned in his opening speech, and also Mr. Yasayuki Sawada talked about. And this is a good recovery of economic growth comp compared to negative growth last year. If you look at recent numbers, real GDP grew by 8% in the first half of the year, with significant contributions from manufacturing, trade, financial services, and real estate activity. So this, this shows the potentials in the economy to pick up and the potential to create new jobs. Overall, Sri Lanka has the right targets of shifting the growth model towards wider private sector participation. The targets of export orientation and integration into global value chains are progressing well, but a bit slow. So what are the opportunities going forward? In the medium to long term, as other speakers talked about, digital technologies could become an important engine for growth and for uh, creating jobs in the country. Sri Lanka could provide new opportunities for economic mobility through policies that expand 
or universalize access to digital infrastructure. And investment in digital literacy is important to benefit from these opportunities. Mr. Talal Rafi uh, wrote a recent blog uh, talking about this, and he also mentioned the importance of women uh, uh, benefiting from these uh, new digital opportunities. I think this, this will be a good potential source of growth and also opportunity for women to participate more in the economy. So the pandemic has brought disruptions to education. So the focus should be on human capital gains, which uh, the government is already following up on this, and targeted policies to reduce gaps in equity would help realize growth prospects. Thank you, uh, Sibel. Uh, I, I will also have a follow-up question because we understand that you uh, plan to leave early uh, for some other urgent engagement. Um, can you tell us about what's the World Bank support uh, for managing the COVID? Uh, what specific initiatives you all have supported and what can Sri Lanka expect going forward in terms of the post-COVID support? The World Bank Group is supporting Sri Lanka's development for over six decades. We are a good partner. And the bank is supporting the government's efforts to prevent, detect, and also to respond to the pandemic and strengthen the public health preparedness. So the bank is involved in different areas under the crisis. In April 2020, the World Bank responded immediately to the crisis with an emergency project of $129 million. Later, this was topped with additional $89 million for financing to provide cash transfers to the vulnerable people. So this is under the social protection and social safety nets uh, agenda. And uh, also additional $81 million to support procurement and deployment of the vaccines. The World Bank collaborates closely with the government of Sri Lanka to align the existing portfolio with government priorities. Currently, we have 19 projects in the country with total commitments of $2.7 billion. Majority of these commitments are for sustainable development and infrastructure, including urban, climate resilience, agriculture, environment, transport and water sectors. And we already listened a great speech about the potentials in agriculture sector. And this is an area, a sector of the economy that the World Bank is supporting. Uh, we also provide analytical work, policy advice and technical assistance. This includes advisory work on investment policy, business environment, and we provide technical support for public financial management. In addition, we have a diagnostics of the energy sector and urban transport infrastructure. And through these diagnostics and analytical work, uh, we provide perspectives uh, to support economic development to the government. Thank you very much, uh, Sibel. I hope if you can stay on, we will, there will be some questions to take. Otherwise, thank you very much for your time as well as insights. I'll move on to Dr. Shah, uh, again from the World Bank, uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Shah, uh, okay, thank you. Dr. Shah, uh, you know, Sri Lanka, there's been talk about a uh, in middle income trap and what should Sri Lanka be mindful of in rebuilding its economy in that context as well as from a post-pandemic context. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kasim. Um, I should clarify that uh, I'm a former yeah, World Bank staff member. Uh, I'm no longer with the World Bank. Indeed, my last uh, work was as the Director General of NCER in New Delhi. Um, I think there's a bit of confusion uh, in many conversations about the impact of the pandemic on middle-income countries such as Sri Lanka and the prospects for how countries can avert the middle 
income trap. They're not exactly the same thing. And so it's worth thinking about a little bit what the middle income trap is. It's when countries that have depended on low wage labor are not in a position once they have accrued the benefits of that uh, particular resource that they have um, in competing with the rest of the world simply because they don't have the uh, capabilities to innovate, they don't have the capabilities to manage people, to be competitive with the more advanced countries of the world. And we've seen uh, this phenomenon of the middle income trap most prominently in Latin America, uh, but also in some parts of Asia and the rest of the world. Um, and certainly, I think one can think about Sri Lanka being uh, in or in and out of a middle income trap situation um, in the years prior to the pandemic with the kind of low growth rates of maybe 3% or less that uh, we've seen, 3 2 in the last couple of years. The pandemic, of course, has hit all countries, uh, but the middle income countries in particular, and so this is the second part of your question, um, middle income countries are in a very peculiar position. Unlike the advanced countries like the US or lots of Europe and maybe some of the more advanced countries in Asia, uh, they don't have the fiscal resources to stimulate the economy the way, for example, the United States has done, where it expects to be back on its growth trajectory by the end of this year. Unlike the low income countries, middle income countries are not uh, in a position to access uh, concessional aid simply because they've graduated. So they are in this peculiar uh, uh, pain a point where they suffer the same consequences of the pandemic in terms of its impact on economic activity, the loss of jobs, the loss of GDP, the permanent loss of GDP, um, and yet do not have either the benefits of the fiscal resources or the ability to issue debt uh, and then be in a comfortable position to repay that debt uh, as the advanced countries, nor do they have uh, access to concessional aid from uh, bilateral and multilateral donors. So this is the peculiarity of the position that countries like Sri Lanka find themselves in. Uh, in the context of your specific question, and many people have talked about it as uh, building back better, so that as you recover from the pandemic, you uh, position yourself to uh, overcome some of the constraints that uh, the medium uh, middle income trap uh, imposes on you. Uh, Professor Savada has already spoken a lot about digitalization. I think the most fundamental impact the pandemic, the long-term impact the pandemic has had is that it has changed the notion of work. And the very fact that here we are talking on Zoom across time zones and countries uh, and with such a large audience uh, is in itself a manifestation of that change. And I think it's a fundamental change that we perhaps don't pay enough attention to. Um, and the consequences of that uh, for uh, both uh, equality and access to opportunity domestically as well as across countries is going to be profound. Uh, we already know within our own countries, and certainly this is the case for India, but I'm sure it's the case for Sri Lanka and other countries, that those who are digitally enabled like all of us on this Zoom are able to continue working pretty much in the same way and sometimes more efficiently than we were in the past. But that isn't the case for the majority of our populations as yet. And so that is already creating a divide. A similar divide is going to be created amongst the more advanced countries and uh, countries like ours that are in either low income or low middle income or upper middle income countries. Unless we are able to take a quantum leap and jump into the kind of digitalization that is making it possible for us. I was listening to a conversation that uh, Indrajit Kumaraswamy was having with Nadeem ul Haq of Pakistan a few days back. I think the Pathfinder Foundation was sponsoring it. And Nadeem made the very important point that when you go to uh, the US and or you go to London and take a taxi, very often the taxi driver is either from Pakistan or India or Bangladesh 
or you go to a restaurant and the chef is from those countries. Well, if some of these things are going to be automated, and I'm really looking at five, four, five, seven, ten years from now, these people are going to find it difficult to compete in those countries, and then we're going to have to have issues around these people coming back to our countries. So I think this whole notion of the technological impact of the pandemic, which we are only seeing in its uh, uh, initial uh, manifestation right now, is going to have long-term consequences for our countries. And the Arthur Lewis model of using low-wage labor to be able to compete and move on to a graduation to a, a middle-income country is going to become more and more difficult. So I think this is the fundamental issue that countries like Sri Lanka face. And of course, Sri Lanka being a small island state, uh, though in a very strategic geographical location, has both challenges and uh, specific advantages that it needs to take uh, uh, cognizance of and be able to uh, 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 benefit from that. At the moment, of course, the debt issue is so big that unless that is dealt with, the foreign debt issue, and particularly the uh, sovereign bonds, the, uh, uh, the ISPs, uh, which are with private lenders, uh, unless that is dealt with, uh, I'm afraid uh, you know, thinking about the middle income trap and the future is going to be compromised. So I think there is a very hard question about the IMF, about uh, other kinds of arrangements that need to be addressed uh, before you can get to the longer term issues that are really important for Sri Lanka's future. Okay, thank you. Uh, doctor, just a follow up question. You mentioned about sustainable debt and also the, the challenge of uh, uh, sustaining uh, the, and servicing the debt that we have. There's some reference to about a common framework uh, any, any insights that you can share uh, for a country that is sort of trying to manage the challenge of debt servicing, uh, given the also the fact that poverty has also increased post pandemic? Um, that's an excellent question, Mr. Kasim. Um, and uh, Sri Lanka is in a difficult position uh, on its debt with four and a half billion. Uh, dollars worth of debt to be repaid annually for some time. Um, the common framework um, actually is something that I believe, from my understanding of it, the G20 has put together. Uh, and that framework for debt treatments has a prerequisite that the country that is requesting access to that framework must be in an IMF program. So that there is a prerequisite uh, from my understanding, uh, and we've had only three countries, or I last saw only three countries, very low income countries, uh, who are uh, uh, already in line to access that uh, uh, debt treatment. Um, so that is going to be the first issue that I think Sri Lanka is going to have to grapple with and the central bank and uh, the political leadership is going to have to grapple with. Do we go to the IMF or not? Uh, and uh, from my understanding, there are very few degrees of freedom that Sri Lanka has. Uh, one advantage uh, of the, and the IMF by the way has said, that it has enough resources to provide to middle-income countries like Sri Lanka as well. Because the other uh, arrangement that has already been in place uh, on uh, bilateral and multilateral debt, uh, which is the DSSI, the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, um, that is, of course, only meant for low-income countries. The one advantage of the common framework is that it requires private lenders also to be providing the same favorable treatment to uh, the uh, countries receiving access to this common debt framework. In the case of the DSSI, the Debt, suspension, uh, debt Service Suspension Initiative, this was a recommendation to private uh, lenders but not a requirement. So the common framework has this advantage and if an extrapolation of the common framework can be made available to middle-income countries. Currently, the G20 arrangement does not envisage that, but certainly uh, since the IMF is in the lead there, uh, it is possible that Sri Lanka in its negotiations with the IMF 
may also think about talking about the common framework for debt treatments and requiring private lenders uh, which are holding uh, Sri Lankan sovereign bonds uh, to be giving the same favorable treatment to Sri Lanka as, for example, the DSSI or the common framework, if it were made available to Sri Lanka, would provide. So I think that's one kind of aspect of the common framework for debt treatments that would be extremely valuable for Sri Lanka. Negotiating with private lenders, as the experience of Argentina and other countries has shown us, is not easy. Uh, and uh, Sri Lanka is going to not have an easy time doing that. And I think the faster uh, the central bank and others uh, uh, and forums like this can come to grips with that, the uh, better it will be for the long-term debt sustainability and the return to high growth. That's really a basis for any kind of debt sustainability exercise. The faster that happens, the better it will be, I think, for a Sri Lankan economy. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shah. I'm sure you'll remain for follow-up questions uh, uh, from the past month as well. Uh, move on to Jeevan. Uh, Jeevan uh, would... Um, just want to get a lot of talk about technology, digitalization. I think you're perfect uh, fit to this panel. Um, what's your own? Because you're, you you build you're building a sort of ecosystem on startups and all that. So I just want to want you to sort of shed some clarity. Yes, we know we, there is a challenge of uh, the need for digitalization and what should be the right way, particularly in the context of uh, you know stimulating economic recovery post pandemic. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll take that topic just focused on, on startups. And I think um, there's an opportunity. I, I think, you know, with, with everything, um, as an entrepreneur, I always look at the opportunity that it presents. Uh, um, um, so I, I really think um, Sri Lanka, uh, you know, based on the skill sets that we have, based on our geographical location, um, uh, Sri Lanka can really market itself as a startup nation. Um, and um, with that, I think drive opportunity uh, for, uh, you know, startups, etc, to create new kind of uh, technologies, um, uh, new kind of ideas and, and creation. So if you look at the South Asian context, um, there is no country that ha has clearly marked themselves as being the most startup friendly destination. And I think that is a, a clear kind of demarcation that um, you know Sri Lanka can 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 really do. Um, I think there's a number of things that need to happen for that, uh, you know, for, for that to take place. And uh, one of the clear things on digitalization, on taking risk, is um, obviously it requires capital. Um, um, and uh, you know, I think when you look at the startup ecosystem and and you know fintechs, for example. Uh, there's been very little uh, capital being put put into uh, to support kind of this digitalization or, or the startup ecosystem. Um, uh, you know, I think even uh, even if we reach say one percent of the GDP of national GDP, um, I think that would be that would enable kind of the startup ecosystem to take place. Um, we also also need some regulation to come in uh, uh you know um you know for example for angel investors or uh vc investors who who, who take that initial risk can there be tax write-offs because they are investing into the local economy and creating jobs locally um, those are things that we need to look look at from the regulation requirement and even like fundamental things like if you want to create an ecosystem there um, you need llp structures to take place, um, you know, you, you need to enable, um, um, you know, uh, the, the, the LPs to come in and put in capital without getting double tax, uh, et cetera. So those are um, some very easy kind of basic low hanging fruits, uh, things that Sri Lanka can do to kind of ensure that uh, the startup ecosystem um, uh, thrives and, and the startup ecosystem will, will drive digitalization. Uh, 
Yes, I think this uh, spoke about uh, just going back on this ADB uh, survey that was talking about. They, there was a sort of weak, weakness in terms of people uh, willingness to embrace technology digitization, particularly in the public sector. Is that uh, what is that being addressed uh, within the government uh, and with the input from private sector? What's what's your own take on that? Um, I think the pandemic has kind of uh increased adoption across the board uh from um garment to private sector obviously uh it is more private sector led um and i think you know a good indication of adoption has been you know uh, demand for uh bandwidth uh, across the telcos has more more than doubled in the last few months uh you know there's been good examples of institutions such as the t-board uh you know going online um, and I think, you know, you can see it yourself uh, near and, and, and dear to your people, you know, ordering stuff uh, on their phones, etc. Right. Um, but much uh, of this adoption tends to be uh, Western province biased. Um, so I think we need to do a better job of uh, digital inclusion, if it were. Um, and I, I think, you know, um, some key elements need to take place uh, for digitization to to really really uh, kickstart such as you know some uh, digital IDs uh, and digital infrastructure and I think the ICTA for example is, is is working on that to allow people to to do you know remote KYC uh, properly etc which is kind of the first step of onboarding people onto a digital platform um, and I think uh, you know um, a better job of the regulatory bodies also working with uh, you know, the disruptors, the, the fintech disruptors, the edtech disruptors, etc. Um, to instead of creating a policy in, in, in a white space to kind of coexist with the disruptors and kind of help them uh, uh, in their digital journey would, would be, you know, a lot better. Um, however, you know, if the private sector and the public sector can come together, um, I believe that's the that's the kind of unique thing that will really take and move Sri Lanka forward as a country, because um, we're not a very big country, and I think that's one of our strategic advantages. Is you know, um, we can really pull this piece together. We're not India, where there's several billion people. Um, you know, it's, it's twenty million people. So I think with public sector and private sector working very closely together, um, we can quickly kind of uh, adopt digital inclusion uh, drive, you know, uh, digitization across the nation. So um, I really think the pandemic has increased people's awareness. And I think um, we need a bit more adoption from, from government, uh, government bodies, government regulation, as well as private sector as well, to really drive it forward. Okay, thanks. A quick last question, uh, Jeevan, you mentioned about incentivizing uh, the, uh, uh, the startup hub nation. Um, there is a tendency to think that the IT sector is anyway already supported uh, through a favorable title. Uh, and given the challenge of um, uh, fiscal challenges, you think government will be, uh, what would be the case for government to extend more tax support uh, to for your startup uh, nation? Well, um, I think uh, if you look at the the IT strategy, right? Uh, it's really driven by uh, a, a couple of things. So the plan is to reach five billion by 2022. Um, um, obviously, one of the main things to do that is 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 really drive uh, um, skill sets. And uh, I'm not talking about typical skill sets, right? You, um, if you if you take the number of graduates coming out of our education system, um, you know. Uh, out of the forty thousand, only nine thousand enter the the IT, you know are are considered IT kind of ready, um, and if we want to reach that five thousand, you know that five billion number in twenty twenty two, there has to be there's a huge kind of skills gap that needs to that needs to take place, right? Um, and I think uh, investment in that skill set is is one of the strategies kind of uh, driving that. Another strategy. Um, to really reach, uh, so I mean, if, if the government doesn't have to look at, uh, you know, in, in giving favorable terms to to IT necessarily, but uh, they need to support 
people to to learn the new skills, right? You know, I think it was spoken about quite a bit in this forum. You need to help people get digitization skills and 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 education skills. And I think that's if that happens, maybe without supporting necessarily IT companies, um, um, I think that'll automatically drive because the IT IT companies strategy are based on the resources that we have available right and, and i think if if a strategy around that can 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 be enabled i think automatically it companies will get better because the number of we need more data scientists we need more people who understand robotics we need um, a lot more of the higher end skills if we want to reach that five billion goal by you know in the next few years right? and i really think that probably is the most important thing um, that, that we can focus on is the education and, uh, you know, going forward. The other thing, um, uh, you know, uh, we will reach maybe 3 billion, 4 billion in export numbers, um, um, maybe if we get those skill sets right, but there's another 1 billion, 2 billion that we have to bridge by building products um, and IP. Um, and that comes from, from, you know, capital coming into the ecosystem system uh, that comes from um, you know new ideas uh, being and 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 providing you know uh, very much as you said Nisha the ecosystem to enable people to to, to come up um, uh, uh, being you know a startup here since uh, um, there hasn't been uh, kind of air to breathe if you if you were right because they've gone from uh, you know um, uh, that into kind of political situations and then uh you know um uh, obviously the, the, the pandemic etc so there hasn't been space to really maneuver and kind of and, and and come up for for startups and i think uh the ecosystem and that uh kind of environment needs to be created by economic policy by regulation uh, by private sector getting engaged etc so so all of that needs to happen to really then reach that one billion that additional one billion and I mean, the government needs to look at that and say, is that important for them? Obviously, it should be. Okay, thanks, thanks, Jeevan, for your time and insights. I'll move on to two private sector, other two private sector leaders. Uh, maybe uh, start with uh, uh, Mr. Tyagaraja as to what would be your suggestion in terms of uh, how can Sri Lanka fast track uh, economic recovery this pandemic, uh, and then I'll move on. Uh, particularly with reference to tourism sector is one of the uh, targeted uh, to revival. Thank you, Anishta. Uh, can you hear me? I'm actually yeah. in the jungles. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, regarding the uh, tourism related revival, uh, I have three suggestions. One is, you know, as tourism <coughs> is expected to resume, there is an expectation that the travel cycle time will shorten further between someone booking a hotel and booking a flight. As a result of that, there is going to be an increased pressure put on the whole series of uh, service providers in the travel and hotel trade to get themselves ramped up to provide that same quality user experience. So A, from the bank's point of view, I think there has to be a better understanding of this changing phenomenon so that they support working capital requirement of these service providers more meaningfully instead of the conventional basis, point one. Secondly, it is also expected or researchers said that the uh, millennials and or Gen Z ecosystem is expected to lead the travel revival in this whole process. Now, Gen Z and millennials uh, tend to use smartphones much more than anybody else. And uh, they, are, they also use a lot of social media in tracking user experiences and getting references. Just as an example, my niece, 21 year old niece who is coming from Melbourne for a wedding here, already had done research on the top three from hairdressers to sari drapers to God knows what. And to the much to the shock of my wife, who thought it was by word of mouth reference, no, it had come through the social media. So when what's probably going to happen is this sort of informed 
new generation of travelers are going to also expect more contactless type solu payment solutions, also contactless type solutions in transacting as part of their travel experience. So I think the industry in Sri Lanka, including the banks and financial providers need to ramp up to meet that expectation. And I think the third is we kept on hearing a lot about these moratoriums supported by the central bank through the banking community. And I think that was a very good start in uh, firefighting the pandemic. But I think as you, as you yourself, Nista, would have seen, these moratoriums have tended to get pushed back quarter by quarter, half year by half year over the past now two years. And something tells me that what we currently have as a moratorium is not going to be enough or long in tenor to really get these SMEs and the players in the value system to prepare themselves to build up. So I think uh, one recommendation is that the government should consider rolling out a medium to long-term supply line of credit or maybe a series of uh, bonds which replace these shorter term working capital of this ecosystem and give a once and for all breathing space than try to do this jump start every three months. But those were three specific recommendations which I thought will be useful. I'll come back to you, uh, uh, Rajendra. I'll just move on to Duminda. Um, given, the, uh, given the challenge of uh, revenue as well as foreign exchange, uh, I want you to sort of shed some insight in terms of the uh, what best way to drive investments, particularly foreign direct investments, uh, and how what is there any room to to offer tax incentives going forward? If not, what would be the best way to attract FTIs? Yeah. So thank you, uh, Nista, and thank you uh, uh, for the International Chamber of Commerce for inviting me. Can you hear me, Nista? Yes. Can hear. You. Can hear you. Right. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, one speaker, or I think yourself, mentioned a little while ago about the uh, fiscal deficit. I think all of us know that the uh, current revenue collection of the country uh, is far below uh, the budget revenue. And the space to increase that is getting limited because economic activity in certain areas have come down. Especially on the import front, uh, we have hardly any uh, income that we collect at the import point because of the significant drop in imports uh, as a result of the uh, foreign car situation we are facing and the restrictions imposed. Uh, then the motor vehicle trade, the domestic motor vehicle trade, uh, leasing industry, all that is have got restricted uh, because of the current situation of the country. Uh, there's hardly an income coming to the government and to the people uh, from tourism. So like that, so many sectors have got affected. Uh, and on top of that, as, you, as all of us know, uh, in December 19, after his government uh, took office, they uh, offered uh, very lucrative uh, tax uh, concessions. Of course, done with good intentions because there was no uh, COVID at that time. And they felt that the uh, fiscal consolidation that happened in the last five years uh, restricted the economy and therefore they need to give more uh, concessions. So with that, uh, I mean, this discussion that we have had in the past, uh, uh, substantial uh, tax concessions were granted. Uh, cooperating, I don't think uh, there's any developing country uh, that has a corporate income tax a maximum of 24 percent, personal income tax at 18 percent, uh, manufacturing sector is at 18 percent, the SME sector is at 14 percent. All foreign exchange earnings other than export of goods is exempted from IT to uh, professional services to uh, dividends to any form of foreign income is exempted. Uh, and exports at 14%, uh, indirect exports at 14%. So if you take the economy, bulk of the sector, in my view, in my experience, is uh, operating at about 18% maximum tax rate. And on top of that, uh, Nista, when you take the uh, investment incentives like capital allowances, enhanced capital allowances, all those things you add, uh, you might end up even below 18%. So I think Sri Lanka has uh, given uh, 
as much as much concessions as possible in my view uh, a to encourage foreign investment b to encourage domestic investment for capital formation for reinvestment uh, all incentives have been given by successive governments actually not only this government uh, we had the boi regime from 1977 Uh, then we have the strategic developments projects act which gives uh, very generous tax concessions uh, running up to 15 years in fact for some of the infrastructure projects like the harbors etc uh, so i think the the necessary uh, tax concessions have been granted uh, to drive investment to encourage foreign investment uh, to encourage domestic investment uh, so i think taxation in my view uh, is not the only the criteria in directly for investment as we have discussed this before also and also our vat is 8% uh, 8% vat rate is, is is very very low compared to the region so i don't think the government has any space to do any more concessions uh, in terms of uh, looking at their fiscal uh, deficit uh, so i think the investments if you look at on the tax side i mean if at all reforms they want to do it will be on the compliance and enforcement uh, because the compliance levels are inadequate in my the enforcement is inadequate and as a result we don't have a large revenue base to tax from of course a lot of people are below the tax threshold but even who are above the tax threshold i think the if the compliance levels can be increased uh, voluntarily as well as enforced if the administration can be made more efficient uh, then i think the revenue collection can increase and there may be space to give some concession but i think without that i can't see uh, the government any space but even if the government revenue collection was good i think still the concessions are good enough to attract investments and fdi does not today depend entirely on tax incentives it depends on other factors such as uh, our labor markets uh, our skills availability uh, uh, our access to uh, capital our access to markets logistics transport you know all all that will come into account in terms of investments so that's that's my view is that okay thank you thank you dominavil i'll come back to you uh, yes. i move on to professor bandara uh, who have been sort of keeping waiting for some time uh, professor bandara there were lots of discussions about the sustainability uh, uh, low gdp growth uh, i know it's government differs from the forecast of the some of the multilateral institutions how confident uh, in your view is government in overcoming the challenge of debt servicing the fiscal deficit with the upcoming budget uh, and also in ensuring there is economic recovery faster than than what could uh, take longer in terms of in a pandemic situation i think this is a this is a situation where we could stand strong as a country and i'm quite confident that uh, we have a will and of course we are also ready and focus uh, to um, deal with all these challenges now many felt that we will default internationally but of course so far we have been able to pay over 2 billion dollars and of course next year we have 1.5 billion us dollars to be paid uh, the budget deficit was 11.1% and hopefully this year it may not be that bad as uh, we have started recovering ourselves let's see um, how the budget uh, will be presented by the honorable minister of finance uh, people are quite um, optimistic and uh, you know very well uh, the industry commerce has taken its uh, quite positively and uh, we also have recognized the challenges and we accept the fact that uh, uh, the shape is a little bad uh, Uh, then that of uh, you know, many may uh, believe uh, that we have to pay uh, the salaries uh, for 1.6 million uh, public servants and uh, the pensioners and some of the beneficiaries uh, still the expenses are uh, numerous and you can't cut down 
uh, the for two reasons. One is uh, those expenses should be there. The other yeah. reason is that uh, which professor, are very politically sensitive. Uh, professor, sorry to interrupt you. Can you switch on the video? I have. All right. Okay. You can't. You can't be seen. That's either. Uh, let me uh, get some technical advice. Yeah, you can continue. You can continue. Yeah, sorry. Mr. Can you see now? Oh. Mr. Can you see Professor Banner now? No, no. Can be seen, but it's okay. Uh, Professor, uh, you continue this. Uh, you can continue. Maybe we'll. Having recognized uh, challenges. Yes. Uh, and of course, uh, the strength. Uh, what we have, I'm pretty sure that um, uh, we, we definitely be able to uh, make a difference uh, in years to come. And uh, the, what we need to understand is that uh, how well we can utilize the available resources uh, in their maximum potential. Uh, and of course, uh, enhancing the potential is uh, needed some uh, digital uh, support. Uh, that's the whole uh, uh, purpose of this discussion, how the digitalization can be uh, use and taking Sri Lanka to the next level. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that the industry and commerce has taken this uh, uh, as a serious uh, opportunity uh, to um, look for innovative uh, options uh, to cut down the cost of operation and uh, the expand uh, the margins and also to uh, diversify their business in order to reduce the risk. And uh, I personally believe that the private sector has a, has a very a serious role to be played. The state can't expand anymore. Uh, it is already overstretched, I believe. And uh, we, we need to create uh, the mindset of the uh, general public that the state is not the only option for employment and uh, the private pension scheme should uh, come into play uh, and the private uh, health insurance uh, should be promoted. We, you know, all what I'm trying to say is that we must be able to share the responsibility of the state. Okay. Now the state is taking the whole responsibility on behalf of the people. State has a role uh, that is definite and the people should be ready uh, to share the responsibility. And I also not believe in this uh, universal uh, support system. Now, say for example, school uniforms, school books, and uh, shoes and various other things, there are people they could uh, afford. And uh, why not uh, have, a, have a systematic uh, 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 a system uh, that uh, directly uh, reach the needy? And even uh, the, the Samudhi, uh, if you take uh, for an example, uh, we have to relook at uh, the who, who, who should be uh, uh, beneficial. Okay. Uh, Professor, uh, I know you mentioned about private sector responsibility. Uh, what sectors uh, is sort of sought after in terms of uh, generating growth in, in the new year, in the next 2022? What sectors do you is the government hoping on? I see um, uh, the, the, the strongest sector uh, is the financial sector. But of course, uh, the financial sh sector should be um, support like an umbrella. Uh, uh, because you see, um, the, the other financial institutions are not yet uh, ready to share the risk. And uh, still we promote the collateral banking. And uh, the, uh, the small and medium scale industries should be promoted. And where they need, uh, the, of course, uh, interest rate you know, much lower now, but still for all, uh, they need a lot of guidance and uh, the process improvements. And uh, the, one of the neglected sector 
that is the, the micro businesses, right? And uh, they have no burden towards government. Uh, if we could support them in a in a in a in a in a in a, in a different uh, uh, mode, and uh, the most of these issues at the at the local and the rural level could be resolved very easily. Unfortunately, uh, they don't have anything to be presented as collateral to the financial institution. The conventional financial institutions are not uh, supportive, right? And uh, we don't have development banking, I believe, in Sri Lanka, though we talked about development banks. So the bank has a bigger role. The financial institution has a bigger role not to act as a policeman, but to as a, as, as a father or a mother, right? And uh, that is one area that uh, I have a strong uh, uh, interest uh, in taking the Sri Lanka to the next level. And of course, uh, the IT sector, which has a huge potential, making the Sri Lanka greener. Uh, and also uh, the energy sector. The Sri Lanka can uh, utilize the, the vast amount of potential uh, to, to um, capture the green energy. Uh, which we have not been able to uh, do so far. Still, we are relying on uh, diesel and uh, uh, the other, other, other environmentally harmful uh, materials. Okay, okay, right. Thank you, Professor. We'll come back to you with the follow-up question, particularly on, on the financial side. I'll move on to uh, our two young panelists, uh, uh, Sanjay, in terms of uh, and and Talal, uh, the two remaining panelists. Uh, Sanjay, just uh, there's so much talk about uh, FDI, and also you're coming from a sector that is be uh, there is a trust sector on the part of the government. How can the pharmaceutical sector attract FDIs, and uh, do we have the scale that they look for? If not, what is the other attraction from your perspective? Hi, Nista. Thank you uh, for inviting me here. Uh, well, um, uh, about pharmaceutical sector attracting FDI, um, first of all, about having scale here, we don't have whether we have scale in Sri Lanka. No, we don't. We only have 21 million people, you know, unlike China or India or whatever. But we can certainly make use of the geopolitical issues going on at the moment because we understand that uh, most of the pharmaceuticals, including the ingredients, including the raw materials needed for pharmaceuticals, that is active pharmaceutical ingredients, are currently made only in two countries max. So since it is only made in two countries, a lot of pharmaceutical manufacturers from Europe and all other places, in, in even in USA, are looking to uh, take other supply uh, channels other than these uh, two or three countries max. So we can certainly make use of that, certainly make use of that. And this is the right time because we saw there were a lot of supply chain issues with China during when the pandemic started and even with India and uh, so many other places. So this is the right time for us to start and capitalize on this. And the number two is uh, we have now BOI have um, started uh, uh, special uh, pharmaceutical zone in Hambantota. And they are offering 10-year tax, uh, tax holiday, which is very attractive in term compared to other countries. So um, taking all these into consideration, um, I think this is the right time uh, for us to attract FDI in terms of pharmaceuticals. Have you seen, uh, do you see uh, local interests uh, <laughs> Being focused on given the support, uh, or do you see collaboration taking place on the pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing? Uh, there is certainly there is local interest because we also, I mean, uh, in 2014, um, uh, buyback guarantees were given to um, about uh, 15 companies in Sri Lanka. So with that, we were at that time we were manufacturing only about 15 products, and right now we are manufacturing about 120 products in Sri Lanka. Which is, which is a good development. And some of these companies are getting ready to export with in terms of uh, to European Union and to uh, East Asian countries and uh, so on. So there is certainly there is local interest in this as well. 
but only thing is uh, uh, to put up a pharmaceutical plant and to start export so it's a highly regulated market and highly regulated product it takes minimum three to four years so whether a lot of local companies are interested in this to wait uh, to this ex to to this much time to export is questionable but there is certainly there is local interest as well thanks sanjay we'll come back to you uh, moving on to talal uh, thanks talal for waiting uh, uh, to to be <coughs> posed with a question uh, talal what what would uh, it, there was so much of reference to uh, how to stimulate growth and private sector role being sort of uh, sought after what role can entrepreneurship play in a, in a, in, a, in an economic recovery process uh, do you feel that the conditions are right if not what needs to be done uh, thanks a lot mr for having me uh, no problem and uh, just talking about entrepreneurship and how important it is before i go into like what can be done i'll talk about like uh, why it is uh, quite necessary so a few points uh, though there i can go on for a lot but uh, the first thing is that we have an extremely low uh, rate of entrepreneurs only 3% so when you compare to bangladesh it's 12% vietnam 19% so so we need more entrepreneurs to come in and also the thing about innovation like uh, uh, let's face it like uh, with the exception of maldives uh, when it comes to gdp per capita sri lanka is uh, better than all the other countries in the region as far as gdp per capita is concerned so we cannot compete on uh, lower wages or uh, cheaper labor so we need to innovate so startups are and entrepreneurs are one of the best ways to bring in innovation to a country and the third thing is uh, the potential we have so i currently serve on the Enter Price Operations Committee at Morocco University, and at the same time, I also uh, serve on the advisory board of a Silicon Valley VC firm. So, so I get to like compare firms in Silicon Valley and in Sri Lanka. And what you find is that when it comes to technical expertise and uh, the potential we have, it's almost world class. So, so the reason is that there are a few gaps in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. So, a few ways. I mean, there are. I can give a dozen, but I'll just due to time, I'll just give a few. So, first thing, long term, is that we need to focus more on STEM education. So, in Sri Lanka, currently the turnout is just around five thousand STEM graduates a year. So, and out of the five thousand, a thousand leave the country. So, we are only left with four thousand. So, when you look at India, uh, the STEM graduates coming out are two point six million. So, I mean, India is a larger country, but still, like when you see per million, it's still five times more than Sri Lanka per million people. So, we need to uh, focus more on this. So, so that's one thing that I'm doing with Moratua University. So, currently designing an entrepreneurship program, and at the same time, I'm writing a piece with an ADB education specialist on the need for uh, uh, STEM there uh, in the education system. So, uh, the other thing is policy. So. in the ease of doing business at the world bank we rank at around 99th in the world so for example when you look at uh, the country that's number one that's new zealand uh, their company registration takes half a day and most of the cost is uh, you know doesn't exist so the advantage is most people want to register and come into the formal economy so if we do that here like more companies will come in and it will generate uh, additional tax revenues for the government uh, the other thing is we need a one stop place like uh, for things to get done the boi does for larger companies but we need for entrepreneurs because at the beginning they are faced with a lot of uh, issues like if you have to market you have to take care of the investors you have to put a strategy in so uh, if most of the approvals and uh, you know taxation everything can be done in one place and most can be digitized that will be a good way to make life easier and also uh, things like uh, you know when i speak to uh, entrepreneurship specialists globally also and we find that this in silicon valley because there is a lower amount of stem graduates in the country uh, there is this uh, less of a supply of these highly skilled workers so one we need to have uh, highly skilled uh, visas so we can get from outside probably india or other countries and the other thing is uh, we need to encourage more sweat equity so that is like instead of paying them you can pay them a minimum salary and give them uh, equity shares of the company so this is something that's uh, very um, popular in silicon valley and uh, last thing i would say is uh, touch on female entrepreneurship uh, as sibel mentioned sibel and i co-wrote a piece on this for the world bank so the thing why we need that it's because uh, if you look at sri lanka only 10% of the founders are female and when it comes to startup founders it's at around 4% so 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 there's a potential in these three areas 
<clears throat> Thanks, Talal. We'll come back to you. Uh, 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 Professor, uh, are you, Professor, you're online? Professor Bandara? Okay. Uh, uh, Rajendra, I, I just want you to respond to what the uh, professor said in terms of private uh, financial sector need to do much more than what they are doing currently. Uh, quick one as to how can the banking sector become resilient to support uh, post-COVID recovery, particularly next year with the, uh, with the moratoriums coming to an end uh, and maybe in a phased out manner, how can the banking sector be more resilient and carry the burden? So in terms of, uh, sorry, can you hear me again? Uh, can hear you. Thank you. Okay. So in terms of balance sheet resilience, I think in theory, the banks are fairly, very solid. I think what they need is to, I think, uh, sharpen their agility in a few spaces to support the country's uh, revival. What I'm going to do is to maybe touch on four or five specific areas, which I think uh, they can play a role. The first thing is uh, we need to see an acceleration of our tracking of this digital ID, which is our Sri Lankan's own version of Ada. As far as I know, Nandan Nilankani, who ran this in India he, 20 years ago, and we were talking about this, and we are still in the drawing stage. But I think if they can do this for 1.1 billion people, we, are, we still can't roll this out for 20 million. And that is absolutely fundamental in the middle of any financial inclusion process to make all what was told before workable, first point. Second point is, uh, I think Jeevan uh, briefly alluded to this, ease of customer onboarding. I think during the pandemic, the director payments and settlements rose to the occasion and gave some temporary relief on how banks could onboard customers instead of doing face-to-face. -face. But I think now that the pandemic is coming to an end or the worst phase, we need to keep that permanent and it should be a permanent rollout so that like world over, we should be able to onboard customers as um, fast as possible and give that experience. The third area is, I think you mentioned, and I think uh, Ranjit Bandara mentioned this about um, banks not lending enough for these small guys. There is a reason behind that. You see, the whole, uh, whole rationale behind evaluating the credit worthiness before they go into cash flow base, is the banks normally look at a credit information bureau report, a CRIB. Now, the methodology used on that is a very conventional uh, methodology, which has probably stood the test of time by maybe five, six years, post-independence. But if we really look at, forget the corporates, look at SME and the consumerism, the way a consumer behaves is quite different from the way we normally look at this. And I think also with digitalization and increased use of mobile phones, the uh, mobile enabled touch points on a phone and social media tracking gives a very uh, much better improved uh, profile of a consumer, the smaller ticket consumer than any clip report can give. And I think as a result of that, there should be, and I think there is an opportunity for these banks or the system itself to look at building a new ecosystem of algorithms which focus on consumer behavior rather than this convention. And that brings me to the fourth point. Uh, already, as far as I'm aware, there is one startup, I won't name it, but it's already there is there, who has built this algorithm. But it's a startup. As a result of that, when they want to plug into mainstream banking, there is a barrier. There is a whole process one has to go through. And I think, as was, I think, briefly touched before, I think banks and bank supervision should not look at these guys as a separate unknown small quantity. If the big boys are not willing to rise to the occasion or be comfortable in their comfort zones, they should encourage these startup guys whether they are in fintech or agritech or regtech or whatever you call it, to plug into the main system and bring in that agility. And that collaborative effort should, I think, also be uh, supported by the central bank. And most recently, because I happen to chair 
the National Agenda Committee on Entrepreneurship, we recently gave birth to this thing called Council for Startups. And the Council for Startups in Sri Lanka under the Zidon Chamber has now established contacts with its counterpart in Singapore. And one key learning which came out of Singapore is the startups, whether you are fintech for whatever tech, they don't need to necessarily only go through the Monetary Authority of Singapore to get applications approved. So this is something we have been trying to tell our local regulator also to rethink the conversation. The current regulation is that if any guy wants to come in into a startup sandbox, a, a startup has to come through a bank. And with all due respect, you having run three banks in this country, sometimes we are not aligned because you look at that guy and say he might be a threat to me. So I think we need to open the ecosystem. If a startup wants to experiment, the, the framework should be there to experiment and co-work with entrepreneurship. So I think that's a very important fourth point I want to say. Okay. The fifth area, I think, I'll just give you one more point. The fifth mm -hmm. area, I think, it should be cloud, cloud computing. The cost of computing has to be brought down. And world over, we have got into cloud spacing. Sri Lanka is still not got into that stage by allowing cloud in banking and financial services. We need to. And the final, in way back as 2015, our central bank, along with IFC and a number of banks, went and signed this thing called Sustainable Banking Initiative. But if you really just look between the the paper in which it was inked and what we have looked today, how much of sustainable banking have we looked, especially when we have looked at a 2030 climate change, like a zero carbon roadmap, et cetera, there isn't enough pushback on banks to actually walk the talk and nor is there a pushback on increasing their compliance on measuring, tracking and tracing either their own initiatives or their customers' initiatives on carbon uh, zero or sustainable banking initiatives. And I think this is one thing we need to also look. So six clear opportunities for the banking system to become more agile. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rajan. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Duminda, I have a one follow-up question to you. Um, there is much expectation on this tax amnesty uh, with December being the deadline. Uh, how is government too ambitious or, or do you feel that the tax amnesty can be more modified, made it more attractive given uh, and learning from some of the successes uh, like from Pakistan and Indonesia? Duminda, are you there? Okay. I think we may have uh, maybe Ms. Duminda. Uh, uh, I want to, on behalf of the Daily FT and the co-partners of this webinar, I want to thank uh, all the panelists uh, for responding to the first round of questioning. I'll invite Dinesh Virakodi to take the second part uh, based on uh, uh, drawing questions from the audience. Uh, Dinesh, over to you. ACCA has been the game-changing moment in my journey, and I'm sure it will be the same for you as well. Uh, get out of the comfort zone, keep investing in your already your existing technical skills and more, uh, which is all what ACCA does. So ACCA definitely helped me in my career. I was able to achieve my career aspiration of being a head of finance of a $200 million business, and I was able to carry out that role very successfully, and it will definitely help in yours. It has helped me a lot to move across industries and to come to this level as being a CEO. Nurturing and growing your wealth is what drives Cal. Because we firmly believe a family business is first and foremost a business family. Our new brand symbol is a representation of this philosophy. A design inspired by the interlaying weave of the nest. 
a universal symbol of trust, protection and family. Home to the golden egg that symbolizes wealth and prosperity. A spherical form that represents dynamic movement. With the colors that represent trust, finance, innovation and evolution. All coming together to embody a unique visual identity ready to take on a world of endless possibilities.
uh, a COVID relief bond, which they can get with the support of some bilaterals, and then roll it out for these uh, institutions, FIs, which come out with clear revival strategies so as to how long they need for whatever it is. So that's one on one side. And then on the other side, I think from a financial resilience, I I know it is supposed to have given some insight, but look, at the end of the day, Dinesh, you have shared uh, two big Sri Lankan listed banks. I have run three banks. When we engage with international investors, you and I both know, they take the food rule and apply the same yardstick. So you can't hoodwink people. You might as well be honest about it. Don't take cover on that. Do what is right. If you need long-term relief, do the long-term relief. State has a role to play, right? But let the banks also participate. But it should be not by doing these little adjustments. Okay. Before I move on to Dr. Shah to ask him a question, another quick question to you. What are the ra radical reforms we need in the banking system to support the private sector to, uh, to get out of this uh, crisis? So in terms of uh, uh, reforms as such, I think the financial side, as I said, has come. As I said in my very first uh, response to NISTA, uh, if I really look at uh, tourism per se, with the impending revival, there is going to be much shorter working cycles between uh, a tourist wanting to book a holiday and flying. So I think the preparatory time of all these service provider ecosystem to get ready is going to get shorter, which means banks and FIs need to understand working capital much better in a more meaningful manner that understanding has to come. But in addition to that, I think uh, Professor, uh, the, the, the Japanese professor spoke about digitalization. But in reality, Dinesh, when we have 24 million mobile phones for 21 million people, if one does a real study of the top three applications of this mobile phone, most of the applications are non-productive in nature. It is for music, entertainment, and maybe chat. It's not using for the intended use of nation building or enterprise development. So that brings the next question as to what uh, banks themselves, I think, have a role to increase the awareness of the common consumer as to how they can become more productive. And as Rangit mentioned, he spoke about the micro and the uh, sector which has been excluded. That particular sector, we have an opportunity of plugging them in, not by going to the Govimatya. He will there'll be a challenge. But you engage the Govimatya son or daughter, the younger generation, and get them involved. Because when I ran Kargils, that is how we got the Kargils Bank to engage with the farmers, engage the farmers' children. And then you go through that process. So I think there is an opportunity to improve the digital savviness of the ecosystem is absolutely important. And the third thing, I think, if we are really looking medium term, coming out of this health and education, this is education we speak. I think Talal spoke about STEM, 5,000 graduates. I think we need to reduce the output of these arts and social science graduates. And as... Uh, the previous Prime Minister, the Honorable Ranil Vikram Singh, used to always say the three, the three E's, economy, employment, and education. It has to be economy-oriented education rather than the other way around. So there is a role, I think, for the UGC as well, but they have a massive budget for deployment that they need to focus based on the national, changing national priorities in deploying that resource in terms of training. I would say those are the three critical elements. The rest are cosmetic to get this thing right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shah, are you there? Yes. Uh, Dr. Shah, there's a very interesting question here. Uh, if uh, The question goes, if you are advising Sri Lanka on forex management and debt sustainability, what would your advice be to the government of Sri Lanka? That's a tough question, um, and I'm sure that uh, there are many experts in Sri Lanka who already know the answer to this question. Um, 
So I can only add um, what uh, Thea was saying, that I think realism is required. Uh, and uh, it is not possible, uh, especially with private lenders, to uh, go beyond uh, what the market will bear. And I think this kind of international market realism is something that countries often have difficulty dealing with. But the faster they deal with it, this is a bit like uh, not being well and recognizing that you're not well and getting the right medical attention as quickly as possible. I think you all know the answer that uh, it, unless Sri Lanka is able to move ahead with its uh, very bright future, uh, given its uh, special strategic location, given the uh, highest income in the region, given its uh, human capital assets uh, and its natural assets, it has a great potential. But in order to reach that potential, one has to simply get over the hump uh, of the debt crisis uh, and alongside with it the fiscal crisis and some hard decisions have to be taken. The faster they are taken, whether it's to the IMF, whether it's some other debt restructuring or, 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 or debt service suspension activities, uh, the easier it becomes to resume activity. And for all uh, players, the financial sector in particular, but also industry and services and agriculture, to begin the recovery process and move on to uh, a much brighter future. So I think the longer you delay it, the harder it gets. Uh, and I realize politically it's not easy to do. But as we have seen country after country, taking the hard decisions, as long as they are transparent, as long as they are well explained, as long as bodies like the ICC and others convey the messages that are required, uh, you actually manage to make progress very rapidly. Uh, and uh, the experience, certainly in our region also, suggests that when uh, financial restructuring programs are dealt with uh, face forward and looking at it in a kind of realistic way, progress is made. Thank you. Uh, uh, I don't know whether it's uh, right. Dr. Shah, one more quick question to you. Sure. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know whether it's fair asking you this question, but uh, the question goes, with such a huge trade deficit, going forward, what should our import strategy be? Um, currently, of course, uh, you're dealing with a foreign exchange issue and the import controls that have been imposed uh, uh, were perhaps necessary. But looking to the medium term, History has taught us that no country which puts on protective barriers is able to make progress. Competitiveness has to be the lead motive of a small island country like Sri Lanka. It has to take advantage of its human resources, its natural resources, and its geo uh, positioning in the Indian Ocean. And this requires it to, in a world where uh, supply chains are really the only way industry and manufacturing and including services uh, are moving forward, it's almost impossible to be protective because you are, when you protect imports or when you protect, uh, uh, when you restrict imports, you're restricting your exports as well because of the supply chain nature of business and because of the automation that many of us have talked about on this panel that is coming the faster you are able to be a central part of that supply chain, you know, I think the, 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 the easier it is to deal with these issues on the trade policy. You know, Sri Lanka really should aspire to be the Dubai of the Indian Ocean. It should really aspire to have that kind, the aspiration should be that it should be an anthropo that is at the sort of uh, uh, cutting edge of a lot of these kinds of services. And as many of uh, people have spoken here, the IT sector clearly is an important area, but startups generally have a great future, especially in the IT sector. And I think this is an area where, again, um, the uh, nature of trade policy is important. Open uh, 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 frontiers are really important. So I would suggest that, yes, 
you know, deal with the debt crisis, but then please move on to a much more open uh, trade uh, environment in Sri Lanka. That is its great advantage. We should not lose that advantage. Right. One quick comment on education reform. Um, Sri Lanka already is at the uh, forefront of uh, literacy and uh, the kind of uh, approaches that uh, it has taken over the years. Uh, but it has to do a lot of catch up uh, in terms of more advanced skills. And um, the advantages that it might have had in the past with the kind of low wage labor uh, and skills uh, is going to erode rapidly. So we do need to think about the ways in which uh, Sri Lankans can perhaps acquire these skills both within Sri Lanka using digital education methods, long distance education methods, which certainly have come into great prominence with the pandemic. So that there is an opportunity here for skilling up rapidly uh, to be able to meet competitiveness issues uh, around the world and using again digital technology to do this. This requires universities, this requires uh, associations like yours to be promoting this kind of uh, human capital accumulation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, uh, Professor Ranjit, are you still there? Right. Uh, Sanjay, are you still there? Yes, uh, Dinesh. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sanjay, uh, you talked a lot about the pharmaceutical industry and stuff like that. Even the fact that we need to attract FDI, one of the biggest challenges we have is in skills, right? What is the pharma industry doing to build those skills? Uh, right. So uh, I think uh, uh, earlier, Tiaga uh, made a very important point about um, requesting the government to reduce arts graduates. So which I think is the, is the way forward because only very few universities in Sri Lanka are offering uh, science-based subjects, especially with regards to uh, pharmaceuticals. So there is something called pharmacology and, and bachelor in pharmacy. So only very few universities are offering that. Even though right now uh, they are offering it, they come out without any practical experience, which we are actually, the Sri Lanka Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association is working with University Grants Commission uh, to do that. Then we are completely short of um, technicians also. So um, uh, that also the vocational training institute we are working uh, to to do that but right now um, uh, we are working on it so we are talking about another five six years yes we will have a good talent pool at the moment most pharmaceutical companies uh, have to uh, get expert employees from india and other places to work here there's a huge shortage of them Okay. Sanjay, another quick question on regulatory reforms. What are some of your suggestions? I know the industry is struggling with some of the regulations. Uh, correct. Correct. So regulatory reforms in terms of, uh, see now, if you, uh, if pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing sector to grow here, um, uh, first of all, if you take the example of India and Bangladesh, how they have become successful is uh, by um, uh, either by um, uh, cutting down some of the imports or putting some sort of a, a duty or some sort of a cess on imports, which Sri Lanka is yet to do. So I think that kind of regulation is a must for the local pharmaceutical companies to uh, come up and to, and to uh, flourish here. Okay. In terms of approvals and all, delays in approvals and... Well, um, uh, I think a regulatory authority is right now working on uh, uh, digitalizing uh, uh, the system, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's quite uh, a lot of issues going on with it uh, right now. We've seen in news. Um, yes, approvals do take a long time, but I think that is uh, world over. Um, that is the case in most countries. I mean, if we file an application in, in Europe with the Union, European Union Drug Regulatory Authority, uh, minimum time to... Uh, look at that application they talk about take about six months so in Sri Lanka yes we take about eight to ten months but then again it is fast track for local manufacturers but all the imported pharmaceuticals it takes a longer time yeah uh, one final question to you what kind of support uh, do you need from the government given the fact that the government is aggressively pushing the pharma industry 
uh well 2014 government uh, uh, gave a good support in terms of offering a buyback agreement and uh, then the successive government after that in 2015 continued and offered more buyback agreements to uh, companies who were willing to invest um uh, right now uh, things are different and the policy is different at the moment uh, but then again um uh, the support in terms of regulating all the imported medicines that coming that's uh, uh, coming into the country without any sort of control uh, we should we should take some sort of uh, uh, regulation on that okay thank you thank you sanjay uh, Thanks, professor ranjit is still there uh so talal can i ask this final question from you uh, in terms ah, yes. of uh, in terms of uh, ftas should the government of sri lanka aggressively push for ftas ah uh, yes uh, i think like uh, when you look at uh, some of the ways that we can uh, do or uh, work could be uh, there's one 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 thing that's interesting because i i'm also on the advisory committee of the export development board so uh, we find that between the year 2000 and 2015 Sri Lanka only had uh, seven new products in the export list and that brought in 100 million dollars so that's like 14 million dollars for each product when you compare the same to Vietnam Vietnam had uh, 48 uh, new products which brought in 54 billion dollars so that's like the on average not only did Vietnam bring in more new products to the export list but their value was like nearly 80 to 85 times more so the reason for this is uh, because one thing we noticed that even vietnam like sri lanka apparel was their main sector but then they uh, like vietnam thailand and even china they moved on to manufacturing electronics machinery but like uh, we still uh, uh, stay on apparel so as i mentioned at the beginning for my earlier question innovation would be the number one thing uh, to move and uh, the other thing is we also uh, focus on uh, exports we always think of uh, the domestic uh, person has to do the exports so this doesn't have to be so i mean like when you look at uh, for example thailand uh, they are a major auto exporter but uh, they hardly have any brands and also when i speak to a lot of businessmen they talk about uh, you know when it's uh, usually exporting like we have to like uh, have control of most of the supply chain but uh, it doesn't i mean now the supply chains globally are so huge that even if we can pick a small point it will be good like the good example would be like china apple so there it's like uh, only 7% of the value addition for apple is done in china and even for an economic manufacturing superpower like china 43 components are brought into china to make an iphone even china cannot do it on their own so so we we kind of need to like bring in companies to do the thing because the other reason is that uh, it's also about uh, technology transfer knowledge sharing like uh, at the beginning when uh, china was developing one of the things they did was they focused on fdi in specific industries where the local people did not have the knowledge so it was always about learning and moving forward and uh, the other things is like uh, sometimes our tariff rates are a bit high so because we always have this notion that you know import restrictions and export high but uh, one thing we have to notice that uh, we find countries such as singapore or switzerland where the import to gdp is quite high and so uh, export to gdp is also high so you need to like import and export and uh, uh, for better trade we need to focus on uh, to get our balance of payments done i feel like we need to focus on uh, exports that uh, need less of importing like for example if you take our apparel industry uh, the thing is that uh, for every 100 dollars of exports we need to import like 60 dollars worth of raw materials so we are only making 40 so ict would be one thing and uh, coming to back to the question as uh, chatyagraja also mentioned uh, we need to focus on stem there's too much uh, on government universities on uh, arts and others so we need to like as south korea did uh, we need to focus on stem if we are going to have a long term strategy for growth thank you so uh, on behalf of uh, the icc i would like to thank all the panelists for participating it was a very interesting session thank you very much and i'll hand over to talil to do a quick sum up uh, of the session thank you very much again hi uh, thank you very much and uh, just to it was a wonderful evening and we heard a lot of uh, uh, comments insights but and makes my task difficult to like uh, summarize on what people said but let me just uh, touch on some of the things like uh, mr savada from the asian development bank spoke a lot about digitization so that is clearly a way forward uh, as we see that uh, he mentioned that uh, bringing digitization can add about 7% to our gdp and 
uh, increase employment by 4%. So, so these are some points. And Mr. Damika Pereira spoke about agriculture, which is uh, quite essential. I mean, uh, if we are going to uh, become uh, at least uh, move towards self-sustainability in this environment with a lack of uh, foreign reserves. And uh, as uh, uh, the professor from Wharton said, uh, diversity matters. So this is uh, an area that I work on. And uh, one interesting fact that I want to say is that half of Fortune 500 companies were founded by immigrants or children of immigrants. So that is the US. So that's the amount of like the diversity that brings in, whether it's we need age diversity or gender diversity, uh, racial, cultural diversity. So these, and uh, as you mentioned, micromanaging. So we need to kind of like with the pandemic, what it has taught us is that uh, people can work from home and people don't have to be micromanaged. Some of the productions have gone up actually. And uh, as uh, Sibel mentioned uh, about uh, the need for uh, and importance of female entrepreneurship as well, and uh, what the World Bank is doing, especially focusing on sustainable development. And uh, Mr. Shaker spoke about uh, the middle income countries uh, and how we can kind of, uh, we are in a bit of a thing where we cannot get aid, but at the same time, we need to find uh, strategies to move forward. So uh, with that, uh, just my own remarks would be that, uh, we find that different countries, different economic powers have taken different routes. Like uh, China has moved into the path of digitization while Europe moves more into climate and the US uh, focuses more on infrastructure. So there are three different paths by three economic uh, superpowers. So what Sri Lanka can do, I would say is uh, focus more on, we kind of need all three at the moment. So we need to move into renewable energy. I mean, we have plenty like uh, for wind or solar, for that matter. And digitization, as we talked, uh, it's the need of the hour. So uh, as Mr. Savara said, there's an additional uh, uh, capacity for growing our GDP by 7%. And uh, so uh, with that, uh, and also, uh, what was that uh, other thing? And infrastructure, uh, like the US. So we need to build more infrastructure. When, when I say infrastructure, it does not mean uh, like physical things like roads or airports, but we also need the digital infrastructure, uh, better internet connections uh, so that the whole country is connected. So with that, uh, thank you very much. I'll leave it to finish. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, Tala, thank you. Uh, over to you, Ruban. The International Chamber of Commerce Sri Lanka is the national office of the Paris-based business organization. The ICC comprises of membership of 45 million members in 130 countries. Trade facilitation, export and import and cross-border trade and issues relating to freight forwarding and many other matters of importance are addressed by the ICC. ICC Sri Lanka works through several committees to debate discuss and suggest solutions on subjects related to the mandate of the chamber. Each of these commissions are led by professionals in the committee, with many committees functioning. ICC includes a membership committee, international relations committee, policy and advocacy committee, training and development committee, banking committee. ICC is the sole authorized guaranteeing agency for Atiya Karnits an internationally accepted customs document which enables duty-free and tax-free temporary importation of items as commercial samples. The Atiya Karnit reduces costs and red tape. The ICC is also known for its popular publications invaluable for bankers, lawyers, arbitrators and anyone involved in cross-border trade. Its members are provided with a member's privilege card which includes discounts with multiple retailers. ICC Sri Lanka's vision is to be the organization of choice to advance international trade and investment for businesses in Sri Lanka. ICC Sri Lanka's mission is to be the change agent in national policy formulation and implementation and facilitator of global businesses with Sri Lanka and disseminator of information on the development of business utilizing the services of ICC Paris while continuing to be a facilitator of dispute resolution. In addition, the ICC Sri Lanka organizes seminars, lectures, meetings with business leaders, and gives recognition to Sri Lankan businesses for outstanding achievements. ICC can play a special role in connecting business to the world and be a driving force for all Sri Lankan businesses.
you seek for business, look for insightful news. If you seek for politics, look for anticipation. If you value lifestyle, look for the extraordinary. If you love sports, look for the passion. Daily FT. Be empowered.